Making the show, I've seen all sorts of strange things. Here, I've selected the weirdest moments from the many years of River Monsters. Enjoy. Me, should I take this off? I would, I would. Yeah? That lightning strike right yeah. on top of the ceremony was standing in the water. He actually felt a shot. He had a, got a shot through the water. Abandoning. Oh. I thought we'd all escaped that lightning strike. The sound man or my crew didn't. Two. Our sound recorder has been hit, was actually struck on the head by that bolt of lightning. Chris, are you okay? Are you, are you responding? Yeah, I'm good. good, 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 good. Right, we might need some first aid here. Yeah, let's go, well. let's go, let's go. Quick, quick, quick. How are you feeling? Good, it just hit the top of my head. Right. We're, 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 we're moving away from the storm now, so that's good. Just a very big headache. Right. And a Pain on right. Hit. But I think my boots took a lot of it. What are you, are you rubber soles? Thick. Rubber soles, rubber soles, good. I've got a bit of a headache. James, who's behind the camera at the moment, has got a headache. I think it might have actually hit all three of us. Chris definitely got the brunt of it. I mean, very, very lucky for him. He was actually wearing thick rubber sole boots, so he's conscious, which is a huge relief. All right, we're arriving at the um, back of the camp. I suspect that the lightning bolt actually struck very close to where we were all standing. We all felt the effects of the strike, but Chris was obviously the closest. The remoteness of our location is now even more apparent. But thankfully, Chris's condition continues to improve, and within 12 hours, he is once more back on his feet and eager to get me fishing again because I'm after something with a taste for flesh. I'm going to fish with the bloodiest bait I know. This being cattle country, this is a bit of cow's heart, nice and bloody, very fleshy, and, well, that should get the attention of any carnivores down there. That's a fish on. Yeah, 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 yeah. What I'm doing, I'm just riding close to some branches here. Ah. It's a very strong fish on this current. OK, here we go. What's that? The fish that took the cow heart bait is one I've never caught before, a boga. Here we go, this fish, definitely carnivorous. Looks a bit carp-like. But this fish has what carp don't have. Oh, there's teeth in here. Just having a close look at those teeth. Um... Its scientific name, Leporinus, describes its rabbit-like teeth, but this is not the hardware of a friendly vegetarian. I've heard bogus can grow bigger than this, but even so, its mouth is not nearly wide enough to bite my finger. Although it's quite strange to see teeth in a fish like this, um, I don't think this is responsible. In fact, I'm certain of it. Carrying a gun at all times is common practice in the Alaskan wilderness. And in case a bear does attack, my pilot, Glenn Osworth Jr., is carrying a 50 caliber handgun. The bears may have already found a good fishing spot. Just literally, I don't know, sort of 15 feet from where I'm standing, there's been a steady procession of fish through, working their way upstream. And there's also some big, dark groups holding as well further down, so I'm quite looking forward to getting a line in the water. There are no bears in sight, so it seems safe to try and catch my first salmon. When sockeye salmon come out of the sea and enter fresh water, the males undergo a monstrous transformation. They develop a hooked jaw and grow teeth to defend their spawning grounds. Not only that, both the males and females turn red and stop feeding, so they won't go for any bait or fly. What you're doing is you're, you're casting out, you've got a lump of lead here, and you flick it 45 degrees upstream. It comes down, and the fish are all facing upstream, and the idea is that you know, they've got their mouths open, 
That is it. That just gets in their mouth. That panics them. They run. And let's say run. Hey. Uh, uh, uh. That ends up in the mouth. So it feels like a strike, but um, and that will be in the mouth, probably like that. Um, but then they're not actually going for it. That's the theory. I'm going to see if I can put that into practice. Time to try and get my first salmon. Well, there you go. You got it. Ah, he's off. I actually, actually hooked one. With this many salmon around, it's not long before the bears start returning to their fishing spot. Here's a bear just coming out of the brush on the far side. Whereabouts is it, Glenn? He's just looking out of the brush, watching for salmon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And that, I mean, that's a very definite fisherman's posture, isn't it? Even oh, though it's a, sure. yeah. yeah, you can tell he's ready to pounce down in yeah. the water. Within minutes, three large grizzlies have surrounded us. Our day on the river has suddenly become dangerous. Grizzlies are considered by some to be the most dangerous of all bears. They can grow up to 1,500 pounds and run at 30 miles an hour. Humans are wise to keep a safe distance. Oh, this is absolutely typical. You find a good spot, somebody else comes in, tries to LB you out. But I think, I think in this case, I'm going to make a graceful retreat. Once they've moved off a bit, I can carry on trying to catch my first salmon. But these grizzlies are putting me to shame. Ah! 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 Here we go. Believe it or not, this is the first salmon I've ever had on the end of my line. I'm so engrossed with catching a salmon, at first I don't notice our interested onlooker. Out of the water, out of the water. Right, come. OK, OK, right. I think we're going to run and break the fish off. Well, I think it. Oh, oh. No. Hey, is it one of the fish? This bear is clearly not afraid of us. And that's a problem. Should we just break it off? No. We're going to break the... No, we're just going to break the, we're going to break the fish off. This is a young grizzly, but although not fully grown, it could still attack and kill any one of us. You can have the fish. Luckily, it's more interested in the salmon than us. It took my fish, and a minute later, it's back for more. This time, we need to fire a warning shot. I'm going to fire away. Oh. He's getting too pushy. Whoa! No! You guys, plug your ears. Just deep breaths. Just calm down. It's all, all part of the, uh, the day in the life of a fisherman in this part of the world. OK, so it's 11 years ago. It's in this very spot. Silvio and some friends were in the water down there. He gave me a dose of water and I was going to go down and I was going to go down and I was going to go down. And after a little period of time, Silvio you know, felt the need to urinate, you know, as, as, as happens. He knew the, the story about the candy roo, so he actually sort of took himself partially out of the water. While he was relieving himself, suddenly he said, you know, he just had a bit of a shock. And, you know, the first thing he knew was that the fish was already, you know, inside. Only, you know, just the end of its tail was out. He tried to grab hold of it, but it's a very smooth fish, a bit like a bar of soap. No good, you know, no success pulling it out, so basically just ran up onto the bank to try and get some help. I decide to throw a net out to see if I can catch one of these critters. Here we go. Ah. <laughs> this is almost exactly what Silvio described. Uh, you know, something going in one direction and just not wanting to come into reverse at all. Look at that. I can actually feel its spines digging in when it does that. It was actually walking using its head. Now, imagine that in an orifice. This fish is just leaking blood. It's not this fish's blood, it's something it's been feeding on. And uh, it is just an absolute nightmare, you know, a real sort of vampire fish, this thing. A fish like this may have entered Silvio in search of a blood meal, but little did it know that its mistake would result in an unprecedented medical procedure lasting two hours. Também não se conhece nada a respeito de um ataque desse peixe e do que deve ser feito. Concorda? 
the first thought was to a bit like um, a bit like a hook that's got a barb on it um, actually pulling it back the way it went in is not always a good idea he was thinking of actually sort of coming in from the side coming in from the from the perineum and actually trying to sort of pull the fish out head first but he thought that because you know it had been such a long time in there they would actually and also the other fish were starting to rot a bit maybe try and pull it out with the endoscope you know out tail first the way that it went in The tail of the fish was about here, about an inch in, and so the head of it would have been somewhere like here. And then what happened was that the, the pincers were gradually you know, manipulated out of the hole here. There we go. Grabbed hold of the fish just, uh, just in front of the tail, and then using the camera, and then the whole apparatus just gradually, gradually, very delicately moved out. Se aquela força é o suficiente para o peixe vir sem cortar, sem partir, sem sem danificar. Apparently it was necessary to pull with a, a certain amount of force, but feeling that it's not doing any any damage. Unfortunately, you know, it did it did come out um, eventually. The fish was sent to the National Institute of Amazonian Research to be formally identified, thus confirming, after centuries of speculation, that a fish has entered a human in the most intimate of places. This is a somewhat momentous and possibly delicate occasion. I'm bringing Silvio back to meet his fish. Uh, this one. Silvio, is that here? Canjero. Uh, <coughs> but this is actually the first time since he had the surgery that Silvio has seen this fish, this very fish. Can I No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just asked Silvio if he, if he would like to handle it, and he, uh, very, uh, very definite no. I think, I think once was enough. So maybe if I leave it in my hand, but I'm. I'm quite struck by how large it is. It's big, isn't it? It's not a fish, but... It's big. I thought it was only small inside this video when the doctor showed me when I was... You know, he's looking at it now thinking, you know, I didn't realise it was that big. I thought it was smaller. It really does sort of beg a belief that something of that size could, uh, could burrow into you. OK, come here, boy. It's just flashing different colours here. Out of the water, this squid's colour flashes from a devil-like red to inky black. So this is the beast. This is a Humboldt squid. Uh, and just what a weird animal it is. You have the mouth in the middle there, surrounded by tentacles, and inside there you can see the beak. I have no doubt this is what caused the scar on Raphael's shoulder and is the brutal weapon behind the other unusual wounds I heard about. It's the key piece of evidence that ties all my stories together. And they have more weird anatomy. This is the siphon. This is what it squirts ink out of. These bizarre-looking predators are like something out of a horror movie, an alien animal totally unlike any fish I have ever caught. Quite an impressive beast. Going back. This squid is a decent size, but I'm told they grow twice as long, perhaps eight times the weight. And there's something even more terrifying about these animals. Within seconds, another line goes. And they keep coming. Here we go, coming over. Hey! Luckily, that wasn't ink. Oh, there's lots down here. These cannibalistic devils rise from the depths to attack other squids struggling on the fishing jigs. I'm told they hunt in packs of more than a thousand. Then, as suddenly as they first appeared, they're gone. But I'm left in no doubt that these are the very same Diablo Rojo that invaded Mexico. There it is, uh, not a stone, 
but a stone fish. What an amazing beast. It really does look like a piece of rock. This is camouflage taken to the nth degree. What makes stonefish even more dangerous is that they can quite happily stay out of water for up to 24 hours, making them all too easy to step on when the tide retreats. And it's the spines on their back that deliver the deadly venom. It's actually got 13 of these dorsal spines and each one is basically a hypodermic. And uh, just a little way back from the point is the, uh, that's where the venom is. And what happens is if you tread on one of these, uh, it's your body weight that injects that. Um, let's just see what this thing can do. Um, found that on the beach, this is the kind of thing I often wear. Put these on for eye protection. And uh, what all happens. Did you see that? It's only when the footage is slowed down that you can see the amount of venom that's delivered by one single spine. Now, if you trot on that, that venom would go into your bloodstream and uh, as well as being very painful, I mean, if you've got people with you, they're going to need to look after you. I'm discovering that making it to shore here can be an even deadlier proposition than being lost at sea. One possible scenario, who knows, maybe one of those survivors stepped on one of these and that just took everybody's concentration. They're dealing with that person and then events just went on from there. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like the River Monsters page.